I'm Kyone Wolf, and this is like my YouTube channel, and I am famous because I'm relevant and perfect and like flawless and you need to get on my level so I'm owning that and this is the day your life changes so thank you for subscribing to this Balls new YouTube channel where I'll be like filling you in on what I'm doing day to day and you know like one of my goals in 2013 is to like do a collab with Metric because they're like my favorite indie band because Synthetica okay that's all you need to know so Emily Haynes hello just shut up and get over here okay so now is the time you can just go ahead and like this video <clears throat> No, seriously, just uh, click like. It's right underneath. Zero likes? How can something have, like, zero likes? I mean, like, everything has some likes. Even things that nobody likes have some likes. Zero likes is like like the universe could implode. O-M-F-N-G. I am nothing. I'm, like, uh, such a digital speck. That I would be better off just, you know, getting off Facebook and YouTube and being one of those people like Jessa on Girls who's too cool to court anybody's approval. But I just don't have that kind of self-confidence. And now, like, I hate myself. I mean, look at me. What What is this? What am I What am I doing here with the tattoos and the piercings and the dreadlocks? Why dreadlocks? I mean, am I making some sort of a, a, a statement with the... With the... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Pause. Those are the sounds of likes. Okay, so this is what it takes to get you to like me? I have to dangle my head in the dark abyss of rejection and humiliation? This is how you connect with me? Through my misery and my desperation? I could do that. I could totally do that. Today on the show, enter the world of Generation Like. Also, New York Times critic Alessandra Stanley on Jimmy Fallon's debut. And now he's been blocked on social media by all the cast members of Vampire Diaries. Colin McEnroe. Yeah, I got a little carried away in my enthusiasm for them. Uh, as in, it's not at the court order, court order stage yet, though, so I'm excited about that. Yeah, we're going to begin the, the show today with a conversation with Douglas Rushkoff, uh, who is uh, known for very many things, but right now he's going to be known for Generation Like, the latest frontline report that will air this evening on PBS at 10 p.m. in this location. But check your local listings if you live someplace else. Uh, Douglas Rushkoff is the author of many books, including Present Shock, When Everything Happens Now. Uh, he's credited with coining phrases like viral media and social currency. Uh, and in his books, he has predicted the rise of the internet. Uh, he predicted the dot-com bubble. He cr- predicted the, uh, in an article, he predicted the 2008 uh, recession. So listen to what he says today and panic accordingly. Um, and, uh, but this is sort of a different different thing in some ways. I mean, if it builds very nicely on, on Douglas Rushkoff's work in Present Shock, but it's very specifically a portrait of a specific generation, a young generation in its teens and early 20s, people who live their lives, uh, parts of their lives, substantially parts of their lives on social media, where there's this kind of metered approval. Um, and so, Douglas Rushkoff, first of all, welcome to the show. Hey, good to be with you. Happy birthday. Thank you. And, um, you know, I, I know from present shock that you are, when it comes to the digital revolution, neither really a declinist nor a triumphalist. But how would you describe the outlook of this particular documentary? Which things that you saw worried you and which things struck you as promising? Well, I guess there was less promise than worry. Uh, You know, the thing that was, uh, if anything was promising, it's that um, there may still be a way for artists and writers and musicians to make money in a social media universe. And that will be, you know, not by selling their music or their writing, but by selling the social networks that they're able to amass with their music or their writing. You know, you you get followers and likes and, and an audience in order to convince a publisher or a, a, a music label, I guess, to distribute your work. And even though you may not really get any money for that, you will get money when you sell your likers and followers and tweeters to, you know, Coca-Cola or to, <laughs> or to Hunger Games or to one of the many companies looking uh, for your audience. Um, so in some ways, that's hopeful. I mean, and there's people out there in Hollywood now, well-meaning people, you know, that, that may look to some like sort of evil business agent types, but they're actually looking for ways for artists to monetize. They're, they're you know, who are pro- promoting that model. You know, on the, on the downside, 
um, it really does push almost all work to revert to the mean. You know, when you're just trying to get likes and clicks online, as your prologue kind of showed, um, you end up kind of resorting to almost anything. So, you know, I got one kid in this show uh, who was named Stephen Hernandez, who was a skateboarder, and he found out that he gets a whole lot more likes and follows when he does raunchy stuff with, you know, scantily clad, you know, Latina models than when he does his little 13-year-olders skateboard tricks. So, you know, that's what he does. He's become, he calls himself baby scumbag. He's got a million followers on YouTube, and it's, you know, pure kind of teen raunch. Or, you know, girls who start out as a singer, and then they realize they do better if they're in a, you know, in a bathing suit in their bedroom, just showing pictures of themselves. They get more attention. So, you know, they become less of whatever it was they might have intended to be. They're not developed in terms of their talent, but um, they move towards the kind of least common denominator, you know, sort of car crash like antics that that get attention in the short term. So um, let's zoom in for a moment on that premise of cultural products and people who are constructed out of almost nothing. And, and, and you know, there's sort of an, um, there's a heart wrenching moment, actually, in the in the whole uh, segment about little scumbag or whatever, <laughs> whatever he's called. Baby where, scumbag. Baby scumbag yeah. Where they uh, forgive me uh, and where they are, t- where you're talking to the guy who's actually a much better skateboarder than baby scumbag. But nobody watches his videos. I mean, he can I do all know, kinds of things and stuff so like that. Funny. He, but he hasn't figured out really that skill and mastery and stuff like that are, are not the the currency they're not the legal tender that's being used in this universe at least at, not well, at that he moment. did figure it out well, he did I figure mean, it in out in some sense i have a uh, respect for him he figured it out but he's not willing to go there yeah he's like i'm a great skateboarder but i'm not that he's gonna go he wants to go to business school i think he got into ucla and got a scholarship there and he's a, a fellow kid from compton you know so you look there's there's more than one path out of the ghetto you know and the the idea that you know that social media uh, it kind of even promotes this idea that, that you're all in this lottery and that everyone now stands a chance and anyone could get on American Idol and anyone could become Katy Perry or some big, you know, Justin Bieber YouTube star when in actuality the number of people who make it in music now is much uh, uh, smaller than the people who made it under the old system. There's actually less variety and there's a bigger gap between those in the top and those on the bottom. So um, let's zoom in on that idea, though, that, OK, there, there are these people who I mean, you, you sort of talk about two different kinds of celebrities uh, in this documentary. One of them is the kind of celebrity who is already kind of famous for something and is uh, in the hands of a, of a marketer who's doing a really good job of exploiting this social media, which we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. And then you talk about these other people who are essentially constructed out of almost nothing and then infused with life by this kind of ventilator of digital publicity and these cascading waves of sometimes manipulated grassroots enthusiasm. But what if I said to you that I could construct an essentially flat evolutionary timeline that begins with, I don't know, Fabian and goes on to Zsa Zsa Gabor and passes through some of Warhol's arbitrarily selected celebrities and moves into the Hollywood squares where there would be people sitting in the squares whose acts nobody had ever seen. Nobody had ever seen Charlie Weaver or Wally Cox do anything except beyond the Hollywood squares and from there to Paris Hilton and we know how she became famous and from there to the Kardashians. And that all happened essentially without um, the aid of the digital process that you're looking at right now. What's what's different then? Uh, you know, what's different from between that and these people who who again, in many cases, become famous for being famous. The, the only difference being they at least started out doing it all by themselves. Oh, there's a difference though between you know you know Wally Cox and Kitty Carlisle and uh, uh, the kind of folks who who uh, did. Uh, pop cultural game shows in the end of their careers, they got there because they did great work before that. You know, no, mo- most of the people seeing the Smothers Brothers in their late careers don't know about the Smothers Brothers show, but they were powerful comedians who ended up, you know, and like any of these people, um, that's what that's what brought them into that into that sphere. You know, a Paris Hilton who really is a child of the the social media era, the big thing she did was had a scandalous tape of her get distributed 
through social media. I mean, she made a career of actually not being able to do anything. That's what her reality show was about, was the fact that she had no qualifications other than being famous. Right? So I do think it's different where now, where when fame is not just the the uh, kind of the artifact or the result, but fame is the goal and fame is the means. I'm going to get famous by being famous, by doing stuff or what that's famous stuff. You know, when I was going around with uh, with the little baby scumbag guy um, in the in the park in Compton, you know, we're following him with a camera crew, and all the kids who came up asked the same question: Are you famous? Is he famous? Are you famous? Not who is he? What did he do? It's just are you famous? So the fame itself is the thing, and I do think that's different. I mean, there's always been pop culture. There's always been a a, a, a and a, a big. It's not just a tiny strand. A big tube of pop culture going through, you know, since there's been television and radio and mainstream media. But on social media, it's all least common denominator stuff. Social media, the platforms are embedded with values that do end up becoming the values of the people who are on there. And that's whether you're just a kid who has no intent to becoming a performer, a kid who does, or a company or anybody. You know, the more of us that are there, the more of us are living in that game show that used to just be on Wednesday night. All right, so let's hear a little bit uh, of, um, this yeah. is actually not in the documentary, I'm just, but he's one of the big figures in the documentary, a young fellow named Tyler Oakley, who really has done this thing. He was nobody. He was a nobody kid from Michigan who started making YouTube videos, and somehow or other, really, he actually is kind of a celebrity right now. People really know who he is. He has millions uh, of people who watch his videos. He goes to arenas, and people, uh, he, he sits up in a box, and people cheer for him like he's one of the performers. Let's hear a little bit of Tyler Oakley. Not all that different, Douglas Rushkoff, not withstanding, as far as I'm concerned, from Zsa, Zsa Gabor. Tyler Oakley, and today I wanted to just do a little update video because there's been so much happening in my life this week, and I felt like I have been neglecting on filling you in as to what I'm doing like day to day, and so here we go. So on Sunday, I got to do some Grammy coverage. I did a live stream, and it was like four hours long, which felt like forever, but like while I was doing it, it felt like 10 minutes uh, with Pop Sugar, and I got to host their live stream viewing party, and it was really fun, and I had special guests and things like that. So many of you guys tuned in, so thank you for watching. If you wanna see that, I think there are clips over on Pop Sugar Girls Guide. The link is below. Um, but I also got to film, right after I did that, I got to go and film some Grammys after show stuff that was on TV Guide channel, so that was on on TV. So thank you for watching that. If you saw it, I was tweeting about it, and uh, a lot of you guys were sending me all right, so Douglas Rushkoff, the fear, I mean, this young man, he's very engaging and stuff like that, but he isn't really especially good at anything. I mean, he's just really good at talking that way, and he's an enthusiast. And the fear always in cultural criticism is that we're going to have so many of these kinds of people who are famous for being famous uh, and, and who are mostly famous for riffing on other people's content that eventually this circle is going to close, and that's, that's primarily what we're going to have. You know, and this fear has been around for a long time. You go back to 61, Daniel Borston wrote The Image, A Guide to Pseudo-Events in America. In 1978, Albert Goldman was writing about disco, saying that everybody sees himself as a star today. Uh, it, that's both a cliche and a profound truth. He says you know, the, the gap between the amateur and the professional has never been so small. That's 1978. So... Now you look at a guy like Tyler, who's very engaging, but he doesn't really do anything, right? He just kind of gets excited about what other people do. And right. Uh, well, what he does is tries is is tries to uh, win the various promotional opportunities that corporations lay out for people in social media. In other words, if you retweet a brand, you hope that that brand notices you. And that's what he's done. He's gone after, you know, Beyonce and Taco Bell, and he's he's pursued them to the point where then they will retweet him, and then he gets more followers. And over four or five years, he's built up enough of a following that now he can do, which is what his YouTube channel is, basically, is he could do commercials for um, brands. He can do uh, uh, product placements. So this what's, what we're seeing here, to me, Looks very familiar. It looks familiar from 2008, that, that collapse that you so well predicted mm -hmm. in 2004. Because what, what we have here is kind of a media and marketing version of what Wall Street called derivatives, right? You, you take right. things and you package them up. And so here we're actually packaging likes. We're, uh, we're packaging digital enthusiasm, the kind of grassroots behavior of young people who get excited about things and click the like button and stuff like that. And then you have this whole group of, 
of essentially traders, right? They're traders. They're, 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 they're called media consultants and stuff like that. But essentially, they're taking that stuff and bundling it like a credit default swap uh -huh. and, and, and selling it to companies, right? Right. And they and they can bring along data and say, now, look at Tyler's following. And I can prove to you that, you know, 12 percent of the kids that are following him are also fans of One Direction. Therefore, your record label should use this Kai Tyler and give him some money. Um, the fact is, there's not that much money in it. They're not really paying that much. Maybe they are to the big stars, to, you know, like the, the Ian Summerholder, who's the star of Vampire Diaries. He has an agent, this guy Oliver Luckett, who's in a sort of a William Morris spinoff called The Audience. And, um, you know, he can sell his four million followers to uh, to a brand when the time is right. Let's hear, when, let's hear a conversation from the documentary. The documentary, once again, is called uh, Generation Like um, from PBS Frontline tonight. Let's hear a con conversation between the two people that uh, Doug Rushkoff is talking about right now. Ian may be living every kid's dream, but he's still reducible to his numbers of likes, though his numbers are a little different than yours. Right now you have actually at 6.3 million fans. You're now reaching 24 million unique people a month. We were looking at the live numbers of the show, and what you yeah, guys have created serious. has a higher number value than actually the viewership of The Vampire Diaries in the United States. It's just crazy to me. Yes, for you. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> so Ian uh, Douglas Rushkoff is, is um, excited and, and in a state of wonderment here. Uh, and one of the things that he's excited about and in a state of wonderment about is that he somehow or other has a larger social media following than the following of the actual content that he's involved with, the thing that made him famous in the first place. Although the question I keep having when I, when I look at that and, and I think about everything else that's in this documentary is, is this some kind of wildly inflated currency? Just in the sense that in 2008 it turned out that some of those derivatives on Wall Street weren't worth anything or they weren't worth as much. Is, is the stuff that Ian's getting excited about, in fact, completely smoke and mirrors? I don't think it's completely smoke and mirrors, but I think it's, it's very inflated. You know, I, I think the people who are really making money off this are Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and they're not making money by selling anything. They're not making money through their revenues so much as through their, their stock valuation. You know, when, you know, when Instagram gets bought by Facebook for a billion dollars, it's not a company that's made any money. It's a company that has lots of likes and favorites and follows or, or Tumblr. It's, it's numbers of users. It's traffic. So really, when we look at our teens, what the work our teens are doing, the thing that they're supplying these companies with is the, the, are the, the numbers, the same likes that kids so desperately want for themselves, that that currency is the currency that translates into a high stock valuation. And, you know, whether or not these companies will ever be able to live up to those in, with any actual currency is, is I think, is kind of doubtful. So one of the things that's portrayed in this documentary is exactly what you're talking about right now, which is that these young people are, are essentially – Wittingly or unwittingly, and probably mostly unwittingly, although they seem to have a certain amount of savvy about it, they're providing unpaid labor, uh, unpaid marketing labor to these companies. And one of the things you look at specifically is the marketing of Hunger Games material and movies and the entire Hunger Games empire. Let's hear a little clip about that. The goal is to create a controlled brush fire online. And so the fans at a certain point are... are convincing each other, oh, wow, look, that's really cool. Did you see that? So Kaylee, sitting in her bedroom trying to win sparks and badges by liking the Hunger Games, isn't just being marketed to. She's actually part of the marketing campaign itself. You get, like, 10 sparks or 15 sparks for sharing something or making something on Tumblr or whatever, or Twitter, Facebook. Um, so that's basically what they used to, like, show how many, you know, how much stuff you shared. This is basically how I find out, like, news about the Hunger Games and Catching Fire. Like, casting information, you know, like, who's on what magazine cover, like, stuff like that. All of those little tidbits can serve as fuel for this online fire they're trying to create. And that is how they both keep interest up, they keep the flames burning, and they prep the next one. So I was watching this, Douglas Rushkoff, and I was thinking about myself uh, as a nerdy kid like Kaylee. And I, I was thinking, I would have really enjoyed this. 
<laughs> and if, I don't know if I were getting really excited about the monkeys. And one of the things that can happen, as Kaylee tells you, is like the equivalent of one of the monkeys might even tweet back at you at a certain point. And, you know, I mean, Davy Jones might have acknowledged my existence or something. And that would have been incredibly cool. I'm, I, I guess the question is. Where's the harm in that? I mean, teenagers always get really excited about stuff uh, and, and get as immersed in it as they possibly can, no matter what era or generation we're talking about. How's this different? Um, I don't know that it necessarily is different or or worse in some categorical way. But, you know, it's certainly not better. You know, if the if the best thing we can say about the net and social media and all of these tremendously empowering tools is, well, same as it ever was. Um, that's not so good. <laughs> you know? <laughs> that's, not, that's not that happy for me because uh, it means that we're still just, you know, we're stuck in the same thing. I agree. For a girl like Kaylee, this is just uh, an expression of her fandom, you know, and the fact that she believes that she is, you know, making a, an important contribution to the Hunger Games franchise in order to make sure that there's more movies. Um, yeah, God bless. You know, the where it takes people, though, is, you know, the, the way to win at this at this game of likes is really to become a marketer oneself. You know, that's where um, that's where it all goes. You know, it's not to uh, achieve something or say something or express something. It's to become a marketer. You know, the rock stars of this landscape are not rock stars. They're the people who are building the next uh, social apps, the next marketing tools on iPhones and and computers. And I suppose it's okay to live in a world where the marketers are the heroes, but what are they going to market at that point other than more marketing? Right. That gets back to my question about the closing of the circle. Do we have sort of right. a, a point at which marketing um, and its various equivalents crowd out actual content? But you know, And by the way, thank you for catching me in a moment of what the Bush administration used to call the soft bigotry of low expectations. Uh, all, all, <laughs> all I really want is for this era not to be any worse than the previous era. That's, <laughs> That's better than right. nothing. You're right. That's very sad, though. Um, all right. But so, what is different, though, I'll tell you, what's different is, you know, at, at, toward the end of this film, I started asking kids about selling out, mm -hmm. you know, and what it means to them to sell out. And none of them knew what the word even meant. None of them had an understanting of the term. I'd say, you know, what is right. selling out? It's they say, oh, you mean like <laughs> selling out a concert or, or, you know, or selling out your – there's no more seats left? They had no idea. So what it means is and, – and it's not to say better or worse, and for at least not for this part of it. But what it means is that kids are living in a, in a world where they don't see a difference between – uh, sold out culture and regular culture it's all part of the same thing there is no counterculture or subculture it's all just part of the same big mush and uh my my concern is then you don't end up with the sort of the 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 nooks and crannies on your english muffin you know you don't end up with those little pockets for strange and wonderful things to happen you just end up with everything being uh, valued for its uh, its its giant mass numbers rather than um, its quirkiness. Although I, you know, as a declinist, I, I, I'm I'm uh, in an odd position right now of sort of saying that there, you know, it may be a little bit more hopeful than that. And you, you, we don't know what everybody's doing. I mean, there there are counterculturalists in every generation, and there are the equivalents of Jessa on Girls, who's just like way too cool to participate in any of that kind of stuff. And so there may be some of those people. But I guess really, you know, the the question that I was left with at the end end of this, uh, Douglas Rushkoff, is, you know, how dumb and helpless are they really? I mean, uh, are they fish who were born into this fishbowl and therefore have no perspective on what they're living in? And, and that, that whole montage you do where they don't understand the term selling out, that kind of suggests that that might be at least partly the case. Or are they the only fish who really understand how this fishbowl works? I mean, one of your mottos and titles is program or be programmed. Um, and aren't, aren't they the ones who are smart enough to kind of figure that out and avoid being programmed and programmed to by becoming programmers themselves? Um, yes and no. I mean, I feel like they, they're they more aware of how the tools work than we are. You know, they're better at, at putting up their profile and changing things and getting moving animations and all that. But I don't feel like they're aware of the way the digital media environment 
influences their values and behaviors. You know, when I would talk to them about, you know, how, oh, so you started as a skateboarder, now you're doing this other thing, and how do you feel about it? And they're all, you know, it's just, it's getting me more likes. It's doing, this is what I need to do. You know, this is how I'm going to make it. Um, that that it, it, it seems to betray, um, if not a lack of understanding, at least a lack of faith or a lack of patience that they could develop um, an ability or actually create something that they believe is of value to others rather than just um, a way of getting attention. All right. Well, the, and, and the, the documentary ends on what I found an incredibly depressing note. This very adorable uh, young woman whose mother is kind of pimping her a little bit on YouTube and, and who I just feel like bad things are going to happen there. Uh, but I, want, I don't want to ruin it because uh, it's going to be on at 10 o'clock tonight uh, on Frontline, the um, the documentary is called Generation Like. Uh, it'll air this evening on PBS on our station right here. Uh, Douglas Rushkoff is the guy who has created this and who narrates it. Um, it's been so great talking to you, Douglas Rushkoff. I've enjoyed your work for so many years. And oh, you know, thanks. we're about to segue here. And the next segment will sort of build kind of nicely on this because we're going to talk to Alexandra San- Stanley of The New York Times about the debut last night of Jimmy Fallon, who in a lot of ways is the guy who's going to try to bridge between old media and new media. He's going to be the guy who sort of tries to to get this generation interested in a very older, much older style of talk show. Check out my man, can you hear me out there? I got a flat tire, anybody got a spare? Comment, comment, comment if you agree with this. Sometimes Facebook gets me really pissed. Why do you keep on posting that man? Stories of a dog eating pizza again. I got locked out of my page, my friends. I guess too many requests I send, so block me. I should say in our final segment today, uh, the one that uh, follows this one, we'll be talking about another television moment yesterday that was on Meet the Press, where Meet the Press hosted a debate on climate change. So there are a lot of people who feel like the deb- we're not well served by having a debate on whether climate change is uh, real or not, that that's a, a closed question and perpetuating it and perhaps perpetuating it with a climate change um, proponent or, or believer like Bill Nye, who's basically an engineer and an entertainer as opposed to a climate change scientist is also not great. Anyway, well, that, that is to come. Um, last night, we uh, saw the beginning of a new era. Uh, the host, Jimmy Fallon, talked a, a lot about how history was being made. Uh, but more than his saying that history was being made, um, you could tell that history was being made just by the way that he spoke. He was hosting The Tonight Show. Uh, but he began talking in a way that you cannot imagine Jay Leno or David Letterman or Conan O'Brien or, or anybody like that talking. Let's hear a little bit from his opening monologue. Our show starts with the, the monologue, the first 10 minutes of our show. So after your local news, I'll come out from that beautiful curtain. I'll hit this monologue mark here, which is a four-leaf clover. That's why I stand over. And uh, there it is right there. And I, I'll stand over that, and I read jokes off a cue card. And these are jokes based on what's going on in the news, stuff like that. I'll make fun of everybody. Uh, uh, anyone I can make fun of, I will. Uh, my goal is just uh, make you laugh and put a smile on your face so that you, you, you go to sleep with a smile on your face and live a longer life. Isn't that the whole goal of what we're doing? Have fun. All right. Alessandra Stanley. We're so excited to have uh, Alessandra Stan- Stanley on the show. She's the chief television critic for The New York Times. Um, you know, this is a remarkable way of talking. If you think about late night television as this kind of hotbed of cynicism, which it typically kind of is, here's this guy talking to the audience in a way that, that you'd have to go back to Jack Parr to find somebody who spoke in such an unfiltered and genuine sounding way. Am I, am I wrong about this? No, I thought, I thought it was um, notable and different, as you pointed out. I mean, it was hard to tell whether he was addressing audiences so young they've never seen a late-night talk show or whether they're talking to really old people who can't remember how it works. But um, whatever, whatever he was trying to do, he was explaining himself in a way that you're not, yes, that, that we're not used to hearing. And, and I mean, one of the things, first of all, let's talk about the form itself. Form, the form itself has been around forever, and there are people who would raise the question, does it even need to exist? In other words, there's this thing, it comes on at 1130, there's another one that comes on later, a guy comes out, does a monologue, it's almost always a guy, but not always these days, comes out, does a monologue, then some other funny stuff happens, then there's some interviews, maybe a musical performance. I mean, it, it doesn't really change very much over time. Is there a reason that, that this needs to continue to exist today? Is, is that a question that's even in play? Well, it is, but for, for a different reason. I think one of the things that makes it paradoxically 
uh, relevant is that that format is the most old-fashioned and actually tired thing we've seen on television. It's been around since, you know, for, well, 70 years. Um, or is it 60? But um, right now, it's it, it, it can feed all this new media because you can take a joke or a skit or a musical number and download it without losing the plot, losing the context, or whatever. And so it's it's sort of ideally suited for new media, but it just makes the the original show all the less relevant because if you don't have to watch the whole thing to see it, then why have the whole thing? You know, I, I, so I have this pet theory, which I will now um, burden you with, um, about sort of one of the problems that's happened in the past. And, and it was most notable when they tried to move Jay Leno to 10 o'clock. So they did that. And, and I was suddenly aware of the fact that the whole ethos of late night television is this isn't really supposed to be all that good. It's 1130 at night and everybody's tired and we have to do four or five of these a week. And so we do things like we hold up pieces of cardboard that have things taped to the back of them that we're going to read off of. And where the, the camera is going to focus on the piece of cardboard where there's a newspaper clipping mounted, you know, and it's just unbelievably kind of low tech television and it's not very good and 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 then there's a lot of joking by Letterman or Leno about how it's not very good and and that didn't work so well at 10 o'clock at night people at 10 o'clock at night really think the television should still be pretty good they're still alert they're watching on their better television set the one they have downstairs not the one they have in their bedroom and they, they think it should be good and and now when sort of people do a lot of time switching and people want to watch Jimmy Fallon and watch Stephen Colbert who actually cameoed last night on the show mm -hmm. um I'm, and, and people want to watch this stuff virally, too. There, it seems to me there's a little bit more of a pressure that it ought to be good. It ought to be durable content that you might even want to watch on your phone a day or so later. Uh, I think that's true. But I also think that back in, back in the day of Jay Leno, they were also realizing that they were addressing in one broadcast very different audiences. And Leno has said, you know, I will try to do one joke that's actually witty. I'll do one kind of silly, funny joke that'll appeal to a different... So they were already kind of cutting up their own shows into different um, uh, sort of different uh, for, for different audiences. Um, I think that there is now, however, because whether or not it makes you money, if, if, uh, if a skit goes viral, it matters. And so there is that, is, there is going to be much more of that effort. I mean, I think Fallon has already done it with Late Night, uh, sorry, The Late Show, which is to try to f do at least one funny thing, whether it's Justin Timberlake or Dancing with Michelle Obama, and that gets a lot of attention. It doesn't necessarily get you a lot of money because the advertising revenue for for um, the internet it just isn't the same as television. But you know that's that's a problem that affects newspapers as well, and it has to be figured out at some point. You know, I, it seems there is a new generation of these um, late night talk show hosts. I mean, we haven't really seen what Seth Meyers is going to be like as a late night host. We've seen Jimmy Kimmel, who's one of the newest comers to this. Um, one difference is, you know, not that, you know, Leno and Letterman and Carson were mean, but they had a little bit more of an acid streak to them. I mean, you, one senses that for some reason or other, the weather vane is blown a little bit over uh, towards the nice and sunny direction. Do I, I have that? De no, definitely. And that's what's kind of striking is that all three, Fallon, Kimmel, and Seth Meyers, are obviously or or evidently has presented themselves as really nice people. People like them. You know, people they work with like them, and their li audiences like them. Carson, David Letterman, there was always something, there was an edge that wasn't just the, uh, their wit, but it was their, their personality. I mean, they were the boys... That next door that you kind of should leave alone mm -hmm. and you know and letterman now is he's like the boo radley of television um and <laughs> i i think it's because it was much harder to be a comedian in those days and you had to be much more of a single mind i mean jay leno was also uh more affable but actually very single-minded you had to be absolutely uh cutthroat and determined because there was only so many comedy clubs and there was only one show and uh, now, you know, you can do skit comedy, there are comedy clubs, you can do television, you can do the internet. You don't have to be, uh, you know, you don't have to be a monster in order to be successful in quite that way. So I think that's partly one of the reasons. You know, the, another thing that strikes me as kind of a watershed that Fallon represents is, you know, for a long time, these hosts were, they were skilled comedians, but that's about it. 
Um, they, you know, they were very, very good comedians, but they weren't necessarily good at a lot of other things. Right. They didn't uh, do sketch comedy. Well, I think that that you kind of have to look at Saturday Night Live, which sort of made sketch comedy and impersonations and parodies and all that thing uh, available on television to to a mass audience. I, I'd say with Fallon, you can go further and say, I mean, he really is kind of a throwback to a much more multi-talented kind of entertainer. The kind of entertainer, I mean, I'm so freaking old. So I grew up with uh, Danny Kay and, and Red Skelton and Sammy Davis Jr., people who could do a lot of different things. This guy can sing. He's, he proved last night he can sort of dance. Uh, he does vocal impersonations, not only spoken word, but these uncanny singing impersonations. I mean, his Neil Young is so much like Neil Young. It's scary. Um, and you almost feel like he's setting the bar in a different place. He's, 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 he's not the kid standing against the wall making fun of what the other kids are doing out on the dance floor during the high school dance, which is who Letterman really is. Um, he's, he's the kid out on the dance floor making everybody laugh. Right. Well, that's very well well said. I may have to say it myself someday. <laughs> right. Feel free to steal it. Um, but you sort of you, you, you sort of wonder also about the shift. The other big shift here, obviously, was from West Coast to East Coast. Uh, much has been made of this. Is too much being made of this? Is it? I mean, you're you're a New York writer. Does it matter that much that it's in New York? You know, it's funny. I got a re- letter from a reader who said, "Why would they do that? Because all the important celebrities live in Los Angeles." But. Um, uh, you know, they all come here at some point. So, I, I, especially when they're promoting a film, there's nothing they there's no place they won't go. So that doesn't seem to me like a big problem. Um, I think it's more. I mean, I think it's much more practical. I think you know, uh, Lord Michaels is now the producer of this show and the Seth Meyers show, and he's not going to move to L.A. So he moved the show, the show back to um, to New York. And you know, there's plenty of people in New York. Uh, Wasn't that sort of that was sort of the message that um, that mes- message was sent last night? There's a, I don't want to spoil anything for anybody who's time switching on this, but there was this whole bit that was done about you know my friends in the past who bet me a hundred dollars I'd never host the Tonight Show. Well, you owe me a hundred dollars now. You know who you are. And then this incredible parade of multidisciplinary celebrities. I mean, it's Rudy Giuliani and Mike Tyson and Robert De Niro and Lindsay Lohan and Beyonce and, and Sarah and Jessica Parker and 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 Seth Rogen all kind of culminating in this fabulous, very funny Colbert uh, appearance uh, that caps it all off at the end. But wasn't part of the message, oh, yeah, you think we can't get people here in New York? Here's New York. Oh, well, perhaps. <laughs> I think I thought the message was um, these are the kinds of people who know like, um, know and like Fallon and will be on the show at some point. Um, but sure. And, and last question, Alessandro Stanley. Um, what, he made a lot of jokes at the beginning uh, about, he said, you know, I'm the host of The Tonight Show for now. Uh, and he, he, he thanked all of his predecessors, Jack Parr, Steve Allen, who I might say parenthetically his sidekick strongly resembles. Uh, and, 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 all the, and he, then he said, you know, he ticked all the way through them, Johnny Carson, Jay Leno, Conan O'Brien, Jay Leno. And so there were a couple of little jokes right from the outset about the perilous you know, st- status of a, t- a Tonight Show host. Uneasy lies uh, the head that wears the Tonight Show crown. Um, is, is any of that real anymore, or is this just an absolute done deal? He's got five years or whatever to prove himself. No, I mean, you know, uh, if it's a flop, the same thing's going to happen. They're going to. Um, it'll be harder because, again, I keep mentioning Lauren Michaels, but he's a. He is a. It, it would have to be a really bad flop for him to to give up on that show because he's got his name on it and he's very important to NBC. Um, and I think at this time they're going to give him a lot more time than, um, uh, than Conan was given. But I think it's already obvious. I mean, that was not a great show uh, on Monday, hmm. but people know Jimmy Fallon well enough to know that he is well suited to that kind of job. So, you know, I, 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 the succession issue is less about host versus host. To me, it's more, Medium versus medium, you know, how long can television keep this going? I mean, I thought it was, for me, watching the show last night, uh, I laughed a couple of times. I actually, I thought it was rather endearing at one point. He introduced his parents who were out in the audience, and then he said, I'm sorry, I couldn't get you better seats. You know, it's just a very odd show. Uh, I, I laughed at that. I laughed. He and Will uh, Smith did a fabulous uh, history of hip-hop dance routine that was, I thought, occasionally very funny. But oddly enough, the time I laughed the hardest was Colbert's little cameo where he, he dumps pennies all over Fallon. He takes a selfie of the two of them, and then he looks at him and he says, welcome to 1130, bitch. Um, and I thought, 
it also that was sort of a um, a moment that that was signified something else too, which is ordinarily you wouldn't have two eleven thirty hosts on the same show, but it's like they're sort of acknowledging well. People don't necessarily watch this show at 1130. We don't really right. have to be at each other's throats, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, but, you know, Colbert is very, is, is very funny. And um, there is some going to have to be some sort of inner synergy between these people for them to keep all these shows going. So, yeah, it, make, it makes sense. Yeah, the market's kind of chopped up a little bit. Alessandra Stanley, it's so great to have you on. I've been a longtime reader of your work, and it's exciting to hear your voice. I hope you come back someday. Okay, thanks very much. All right, so that's Alexander Stanley. She's talking about Jimmy Fallon. He is the guy who somehow or other has to figure out how to get that generation that Douglas Rushkoff was talking about to watch late-night television, the standard old model late-night show. All right, we'll be back with another conversation about something else that happened on television this weekend. You know, I, I actually missed the Jimmy Fallon debut last night because Jay Leno showed up at my apartment and he did a monologue in my kitchen. Poor guy. Today's show was produced by Betsy Kaplan and me. Greg Hill tweets for us at WNPR Colin and Katie Talarski is our executive producer. The part of Bill Curry was played by Lowell Thomas. For show pages, stories, links, and videos of the Faith Middleton Show staff doing a synchronized skateboard routine of kickflip, heel flip, ollie with a pop shove it finale, visit our website WNPR.org. On tomorrow's show, we're live from our downtown pop-up studio challenging everything you think you know about Connecticut during the Civil War. And now, back to Colin. Yeah, let me just take two seconds to elaborate on that. So we're uh, at our downtown pop-up studio, which is on Trumbull Street. It's sort of embedded into the, the facade of the XL Center. Um, we'll do the wheelhouse tomorrow at 9 a.m. there. Mr. Dankosky and I will be there, I think, with Bill Curry and Lord knows who else. And these are kind of open to the public. If you're wandering around the uh, snow-infested downtown area. Please feel free to drop by and join us. That's at 9 a.m., of course, 1 p.m. We'll be back. We will be doing kind of our another Civil War revisionism show. People in Connecticut have this idea that Connecticut was, like, always this really nice place, and we were all abolitionists, and uh, it's just not true, unfortunately. <laughs> the, um, the story of Connecticut during the Civil War has a lot more spiders crawling around on it than people like to believe. So we'll be spending some time on that tomorrow. Um, all right. So our final um, conversation here is with Ben Geeman. He is the energy and environment correspondent for the National Journal. Um, yesterday, or excuse me, Sunday, uh, something happened that uh, perhaps has more uh, lo- long-lasting implications than even Jimmy Fallon. Uh, it happened on the same network that was uh, Meet the Press, uh, David Gregory, hosting a, a conversation between uh, somebody who believes in climate change and somebody who does not. Um, and so Ben Geeman, Eamon, first of all, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. So this brought together um, a member of Congress who who is um, a disbeliever, Mar- Marsha Blackburn, who does not believe, or at least says she does not particularly believe, that uh, the conventional scientific model of climate change is true, uh, versus Bill Nye, who's kind of a science educator, engineer, entertainer kind of guy who's now making a little bit of a specialty as an itinerant debater on behalf of science. Um, and, and so there were people, if I am correct, who just objected to even the premise of this, right? That by be, by be, it's like being willing to debate the validity of the Holocaust. You've already given way too much ground to one side that doesn't really have any entitlement to it. Well, that's right. You know, there was a lot of pushback against this segment, but even before it aired, You had uh, progressive activists and a liberal watchdog group, Media Matters for America, and others really objecting to the way that NBC packaged this. Because what happened was NBC said, we are going to hold a, quote, debate. And from there, the die was really cast. Because once you sort of say you're going to have a debate about climate change, it doesn't sort of matter on some level what part of that topic you're referring to, you know, policy, politics, the science, this got held up immediately as NBC saying the science is unsettled. We're going to have on these two people, one uh, Tennessee Republican who, as you point out, is a a climate skeptic, another Bill Nye, the science guy who agrees with and can explain uh, pretty well the scientific consensus. So it seems like NBC just kind of set this up as this kind of he said, she said, and fell victim to this kind of false balance issue, if you will. Now, on the segment itself, to be fair, Meet the press host, David Gregory, really tried to get, change that impression. I mean, he said right out of the gate, the science 
scientific, there is a scientific consensus about global warming, and it's that humans are a big contributor. And he even interrupted Marsha Blackburn at one point, the, the Tennessee congresswoman, when she was saying there's no consensus. He said, no, 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 I have to interrupt you, congresswoman. Uh, there is a scientific consensus. So while Gregory sort of went to some length to sort of make it a debate about climate issues but not climate science, on some level, the die was sort of cast, and again, I think once you have someone on whose moniker is, quote, the science guy, and you're talking about global warming, you sort of on, almost implicitly said, we're having a debate about climate science. Yeah, I sensed watching uh, it afterwards that Gregory felt kind of the hot breath of his critics, you know, the people who basically said this debate shouldn't be happening. And so it seemed kind of a little out of sequence. It's kind of like he, he kept saying, well, there's no real debate about this. But what do you think, person I had on here who doesn't believe? I mean, it, it, you can't really have it both ways. You can't begin the segment and then jump in periodically putting out these fires. Um, you invited the fire starter in the first place. Um, and, and so it it seemed as though there were sort of two shows happening at once, the one where these two people show up and debate about this, and then the one where the host claims there really isn't any debate to be had. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I, the word debate became really problematic. I mean, I, of course, can't uh, crawl inside of, of Mr. Gregory's head or his thoughts, so I'm not sure to what extent he was responding to critics or not. But, you know, there are plenty of things to debate about when it does come to climate change. You know, what are the appropriate... Uh, policy responses, what should the political response be? Is X or Y moved by the EPA or other agencies involved in green energy? Are these the right things? Are they too expensive? So, you know, again, there are a lot of sort of things that are open to debate when it comes to climate change. I think if I can just put on a bit of a media critic hat for a second, where NBC created a little bit of confusion was they sort of almost inevitably set this up as a debate on science, and even when they sort of took you know, even when Gregory took a number of steps to say, no, 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 guys, we're not debating the science, uh, there was really, you know, that die again was sort of, uh, was sort of cast. I mean, I, you know, this is interesting. It's coming at a really interesting political moment because, you know, just a month ago, we had nine Senate Democrats write a letter to the big four networks saying, hey, guys, look, you've been almost ignoring climate change on the kind of Sunday talking head shows. So, Let's step it up a little bit. Let's see some more coverage. You know, this, this liberal watchdog group, Media Matters, had found that in all of 2013, there had been just 27 minutes on the Sunday pundit shows, and even that was like three times what there was the year before. So I think what was so fascinating about this is you had this big push to have climate covered on the Sunday shows, but then when sort of, you know, one of the biggest and most important shows, Meet the Press, came around and did it, folks said, eh, you kind of screwed it up a little bit. Uh, so be careful what you wish for. And, and yeah. I, I think one of the other things, one of the other criticisms is, is Bill Nye the right guy to do this? I mean, Joyce Carol Oates knows a lot about boxing. She's written books about uh, boxing, and she's a very articulate person. I wouldn't send her out to fight Marvin Hagler. And, and so one of, the, one of the questions is, is Nye, he's a good communicator, right, but he's not a climate scientist. Is he the right guy uh, to, to make this case if there is going to be any kind of debate? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I don't, you know, quite frankly, I, I have no problem with that whatsoever. I mean, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, journalists and other experts and, you know, there's a lot of different people who can very capably speak to where the science is on this topic. I mean, perhaps you could say ideally the person who's speaking to that is, in fact, an actual climate scientist. But I think there's any number of different people who can sort of accurately and in a way that's useful to the audience portray what the status of the science is, and I think Bill Nye is certainly more than capable of doing that. So I didn't have any huge problem with Nye being sort of the stand-in for, for science, if you will. Um, I think what, was, what made this a bit of a sort of neither fish nor fowl segment was you had one person who was, whose forte is science and science education. You had another person, Congresswoman Blackburn, who is a policymaker and a lawmaker. And so once you've set this, up as, set this pairing up as a debate, it immediately sort of forces the question, well, what are they going to debate about? So, again, once they sort of called this thing a debate, it sort of may, almost made it about science before Gregory could even get the first questions out. Ben Geeman, so great to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Read Ben Geeman's work in the National Journal, where he's the energy and environment correspondent. we got to go. Uh, but this has been a fun show. I really liked it. Thanks to Bitsy Kaplan and Kyan Wolf for pulling it all together.
I'm Kyone Wolf. Thank you for watching The Tonight Show. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Good night. Ugh, stupid audience. All they want is like lowbrow gossip celebrity jokes. So beneath me. Kyone, your mic is still on. You're fired. Uh, who are you going to replace me with? I mean, I'm smart. I'm funny. I'm beautiful. Uh, who? We're thinking Jimmy Fallon. <sighs> okay. He is prettier than me.